Good morning, and welcome to online worship at Douglasville First United Methodist Church. Everyone is welcome here at Douglasville First. We're glad that you are joining us here this morning. If you're watching us on Facebook or YouTube, make sure you like, comment, share, and go ahead and drop a line and let us know that you joined us this morning. Make sure you stay after the sermon to see a special missions video. All right, let's worship. you 
Good morning, church. We are after Easter now. We're starting a brand new series called Rise Up. And we're going to be looking at the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus over the next couple of weeks and the power that resurrection has for us. We know what we just celebrated in Easter and the, the, the joy of resurrection and the joy of all that Jesus did. But there's also power in it. And we're going to be looking at these, these instances over the next few weeks. So today we're going to start with one of the most uh, famous post-resurrection stories. And that's Jesus on the road to Emmaus. And we're going to read that story, and then we're going to come back and talk about it for just a minute. And it's found in Luke chapter 24, beginning with verse 13. It's kind of a lengthy passage, but listen to this story. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you, the, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed among God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen visions of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. How cool would that be to talk about all these things that actually talked about you as Jesus is having this conversation with them? And so he goes on as they approached the village to which they were going. Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day's almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? And then, of course, they run to Jerusalem to tell the apostles all that had happened. The, it's a great story. I mean, obviously, it's a beautiful story. It's a powerful story. It's, it's an a entertaining story. But the thing I want to kind of focus in on today is what they said to him when they, he asked what's going on. So they tell him that this Jesus, whom they loved, was being, had been put to death and crucified. And then they say this, we had hoped that he was going to be the one who redeemed Israel. We had hoped, past tense, he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Now, we all know what it is to have hope dashed. Uh, no, you can't live in this world and at some point not have hope dashed to some point, broken, uh, unfulfilled dreams, whatever you, you want to call it. But let me put this in a context to understand just how powerful these words are for these two men. For a Jew living in that day and time, waiting on the Messiah... You have waited generations and generations and generations and generations, thousands of years. The story's been told among your people of a Messiah that would come. You've heard the prophets talk about a Messiah. You've heard uh, references to the Messiah. You've heard your family all your life talk about when Messiah comes, when Messiah comes. And through the years, there have been uh, great men of God that maybe that kind of started thinking, hey, maybe this is the time, Right. Uh, Elijah, Elisha, David, Solomon, these great leaders of Israel, these prophets, kings, who maybe they were the ones that were going to raise up and, and be the Messiah. And as it went on, we know that they weren't. But for a Jew, your whole history, your whole heritage, your whole race, everything about you is waiting on Messiah. It's part of your prayers you pray every day. It's part of the culture that you live in every day. It's just the culture, the religion, the politics, all of it's one for a Jewish person. And so 
to understand the hope for Messiah was a powerful, powerful thing. And to have that hope dashed, because here's what happens. Jesus comes on the scene, right? You've grown up hearing about Messiah. You've grown up waiting for Messiah. You've prayed with your parents. You've prayed with your grandparents. You've prayed the prayers. And Messiah is always part of the focus. One day, one day, our nation will be redeemed. One day, we'll be back again. One day, we'll be where God wants us. One day. And now there's Jesus. And he's walking on this earth in his miracles and healings and teachings with authority and these people decide to follow him and at some point decide that you know what this guy is the one we want to follow this guy's the one we're putting our hope in now they're not just saying hey we think we'll do this for a while because it's trendy we think we'll do this for a while because uh, this is kind of cool or this is the path we've chosen they are banking everything on the fact that this is the one Israel's been waiting for for all of these years and all of these generations. We're getting to be with the guy who our grandparents prayed about, who our great-grandparents told us about. We are here. It's happening. This is awesome. This is the one. Who else could do the things he's doing? Who else could, could come and say the things he's saying and put the teachers and religious leaders in their place and who could raise the dead? Who else could do these things? It has to be. It has to be the one we've waited on. So that's the, the weight of this for these men. And so when Jesus is crucified and he dies on the cross, all of that hope, all of that hope is crushed for them because they don't yet understand all the things he's told them. They don't yet quite comprehend resurrection of the dead, even though they've seen it with Lazarus. We had hoped he was the one. It's been three days. I would imagine for a couple of days they just stood and stared and sat and just cried. And you know what it's like when you see something, the rug pulled out from under you or something just doesn't transpire like you thought it would. You just kind of sit and stare off into space. Maybe that's what they were doing for a couple of days. Maybe they waited for the crowds to thin. I don't know. All I know is when they say we had hoped, it carries more weight than, than us you know, hoping that we might get that new car or hoping that we might get that job. Those things are important too, but it's a little bit different dream here. It's a little bit different crush than just not getting something we wanted. All of their people, all of their ancestry, all of their prayers, all had been put in in an all-in moment hoping this one was going to be the Messiah. It fit everything, didn't it? So I want you to understand this is a big deal to these men. And they're walking slowly this seven miles, just kind of shuffling along, getting to that place and, and, and trying to find out what to do next and trying to get their head around what, what this is going to be like now. now. I mean, you know, it was all right. It was always the same. But now that we've almost seen him and we thought we had him, how can we go back to normal life? What does that look like? What does it mean? And so all of a sudden, Jesus shows up. And starts walking with them. Now that wouldn't have been unusual on a road like that, on a journey like that. They would have just had people walk along with them. But Jesus very intentionally does this and he keeps them from recognizing him. Now whether you want to call that a supernatural moment and their eyes are kept from seeing him, that's fine. I, I believe that that's absolutely probably the case. Or they're just so dejected they just don't look up. Either way it works. Jesus is walking along with them. He says, hey, what's going on? Why are you so downcast? <laughs> Oh my goodness, are you the only one? Are you the only one who's been in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's going on? I mean, this thing is crazy. I mean, it's screaming and, and there's earthquakes and there's stuff happening because this man died and we don't even know what to think or what to make of it. Oh, we had hoped. We had hoped. And Jesus hears those words. I believe with all my heart Jesus hears those words. And I think that's what he reacts to. We had hoped he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. And so you almost see a little bit of attitude there, don't you, from Jesus. How foolish are you? How slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Didn't the Messiah have to suffer? Doesn't Scripture clearly say these things? And then he begins to tell them the story. And he goes back all the way to Abraham and Moses and all the prophets. And he's telling them a story of things they already know, but they don't know. He's expanding their vision of something. 
Have you ever had someone try to teach you something, and you're looking right at the thing they're trying to teach you or the thing they're trying to show you, and they're, and they're explaining to you what you're seeing? Now watch this, they might say, and you're watching. You're like, okay, I don't see anything. I don't see anything. Now watch. Watch what happens when this comes. And watch what happens when this part gets put in place. And all of a sudden, as it starts to make sense to you, you go, oh, oh, I see it now. Oh, I get it now. And we've all had that moment whether somebody was teaching us something about math or somebody was teaching us something about art or somebody was showing us a new invention. But we have that moment where we go, oh, oh, I see. Jesus is doing that for these guys. He's expanding their vision, taking pieces and parts that they already know and putting them together for them. He's expanding their vision. Now, the point of that is, that's exactly what he intended to do. So they, they, they're, they're hearing this and they're, they claim after the fact that I'm sure it's true. As he's telling them, their hearts are, hey, this guy really knows stuff. This guy really seems to understand. Wait a minute. You know, Jesus did say that. You know, Isaiah did say that. And wait a minute, what's happening here? This is starting to make sense. So they get to where they're going, and Jesus acts like he's going to go further. And they do the whole thing. You know, oh, no, 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 you got to come. No, I've, got, I've really got to go. No, we insist, you stay. And so that whole scene plays out. Jesus goes in and breaks bread with them. And I don't know the custom. I, I, I don't. I probably should have researched that more for you. But for whatever reason, Jesus is the one that's going to break bread that night and give thanks. And maybe it was the custom that a guest does that. But as he breaks bread and gives thanks, they see him. They're allowed to recognize him. The resurrected Christ, their friend, the one they had followed, is sitting at their table alive and absolutely fine. And all of a sudden, they recognize him, and he disappears from their sight. Now, remember, this is the resurrected Jesus. He's not limited by our bodies anymore. He's not limited by our time anymore. He, he pretty much can do what he wants. And so he disappears from their sight. There was a purpose in this. The purpose was that this story be told. And so they begin to shout, oh, my goodness, didn't we understand? Didn't we know that something was happening in our hearts? We should have seen this. And the seven miles that they walked, I don't know how long it took them, shuffling along, sad, dejected, may have taken them hours to walk that seven miles. I, I think they probably set some world-class speed getting back because they leave at that moment in the evening, which is dangerous, and they run back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples what they had seen. Now, what does all that mean to us? That's a great story, isn't it? I mean, it's one of my favorites. But what a great story. But what does it mean to us? We have hopes too, don't we? We have hopes that God's going to be what we think he is, what we believe he is. We have hopes that the Christ is going to be for us, everything. When we talk about resurrection power, and you hear preachers talk about it, and you hear sermons on it this time of year, right after Easter, and, and we, we wax eloquent, right? I mean, we talk about all this stuff, and we give you scriptures, and we talk about the power of resurrection, and we throw stuff out there, but does it mean anything? This is a, this is a real question. Does it mean anything? I'm going to guess that every one of us, at some point in our journey, has said in our heart, and I mean in our heart, deep inside us, we may never say these words out loud because we're scared to. We may never say these words in a way that we, we think they would ever come across as disingenuous or hurtful to God. But at some point, I'm going to guess that we have all wondered, even for the briefest second, is he? Can he? Will he? Is he who he says he is? Can he really hear me when I pray? Will he really answer my prayers if I bring them to him? Does he really know how much I'm hurting? Does he really understand what I'm going through? Does he really understand the confusion I have? Does he really care about these things? I think those questions have to, in an honest relationship, have to surface at some point. And Jesus absolutely can do all of those things. The answer is simple, yes. But I want you to understand, as he expanded their vision and expanded their minds by telling them the stories that they already knew and explaining to them what Messiah had to do, the same thing works for us. Because those questions are honest and everybody has them and everybody goes through that at some point in your journey, especially in difficult times. Okay, I know the stories where he calmed the sea and I know the stories where he healed the sick. But can he still do that? Does he still do those things? We're looking for faith, aren't we? Well, see, I believe Jesus still wants to expand our vision and expand our minds. 
Now understand, in this particular context, he did it through telling them things that were that would become our Bible, but were his word, right? He does it by quoting the prophets and talking about Moses and telling them how all this works through the understanding of scriptural uh, happenings that would be written down years later. And some of them were already written down as far as the prophets were concerned. But he tells them stuff that, that he said as well. And so what I'm getting to is this, that if you want to bring those questions to a place where you're going to get answers and you want to really find a place where you're, and your vision and your mind is expanded to understand the things of God, I believe it's always going to be through His Word. I believe it's always going to be through hearing and staying in places where you're taught the Word of God and being in community where the Word of God lives. I don't just mean being in community. Be careful with this. Uh, not every church is a community of God's Word. Not every gathering is a community of God's Word. There are churches who do a lot of good things, but they're not always about God's word. And then we wonder why the church doesn't have more power. Brothers and sisters, it's got to be through his word. It has got to be through his word because this is where we find the story. This is where we find his spirit. This is where we find his power. And the more we study it, and the more we understand it, and the more we discuss it, and the more we live it out in our communities, the more our vision is going to be expanded. The more we're going to see and understand, the more God's going to start going, hey, now watch this. You've seen this before, but watch what I do with it. Oh, oh, I see that now. I missed that before. That's why we can read the scriptures and read the same passage over and over and over again and come to a place at certain points in our life and read it one more time and go, oh, I never saw that before. Wow, that really speaks to me. That speaks exactly the word I need to hear. That's why I can do it, because it's a living word, and it's God's word. And if we're going to rise up in the power of resurrection, if we're going to rise up and understand the fullness that he wants for us to see here, it's only going to come through his word. And so I want to encourage you today that the power of resurrection is real, that what Jesus did was absolutely a fact. And if you want to walk in that and understand it, and be like these followers of Jesus and have your vision expanded to just how it can apply not only to your life, but to your family, to your ministry, to your church. Spend time in his word. Spend time studying his word and letting others teach you and hearing sermons and being in community where the word of God is lived out and acted upon. It will absolutely change your world. So... Pretty simple takeaway here, isn't it? My prayer is that when I ask those questions, can he, will he, does he, that every time I ask him, I've got a little more faith to say yes. I may get to a point where I'm just an absolute yes in some things and not in other things. But I want to always be growing in that. And I want to let the God, the King of Heaven, the Messiah, the risen Christ, reveal things to me that I have yet to see. As much as I've studied this Bible, there are still things I've yet to see. And that's exciting, isn't it? Power of resurrection is, means He's bringing life to us all the time. That we are resurrected with Him in fullness of life and power and fullness of the Spirit. And one day we'll be resurrected physically, bodily with Him in heaven. But it doesn't just mean then. I think it starts now. So I want to encourage you, if you're not in a Bible study, get in one. If, you, if you're looking for one, uh, contact us or contact your church if you're watching from somewhere else. If uh, you're not in a community where they're living out scriptural uh, teachings, then find a community that does. It, it's, it's worth it. And be about the life-giving power that Jesus gives us. We had hoped. And now they got to see their hope realized. What a great day that was for these guys. We had hoped, and I promise you, Jesus wants to fulfill all those hopes that we have as well. But we have to spend the time listening to him, letting him tell us the stories, letting him tell us and reveal his word to us. So that's your challenge, and I hope that's encouraging to you, and I hope that you start to walk in that power more and more. And if you have, and you know what I'm talking about, and some of you are amening this thing because you know what I'm saying, that you, when you read the word of God, it really does come alive. Keep going. Don't ever stop short. You're not there yet. There's never a way we ever get it all. But we're getting closer. And he opens our minds and our hearts every time. 
So God bless you. Let me pray with you as we close out that God will do this in your life as you are obedient to follow his word. And uh, then we'll close. Father, thank you for what you've done in resurrection. And thank you for what you've given us through the power of your word. And Lord, as all of us are making decisions right now to say, you know what, I need to study it more. I need to read it more. I need to be in it more. Father, let those decisions be, be uh, mind and vision expanding moments for all of us that we'll see a little bit more, or hopefully a lot more, of what you want us to know and see so that we can be more effective, so that we can be more blessed, so that we can walk in it in power and in joy. God, open our hearts and minds as we study, as we read, as we look, as we share your word. We thank you for this, Jesus, and thank you for the power of resurrection. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to do this a few more times through this series and look at these places where Jesus shows up post-resurrection. It's powerful stuff, so stay with us and join us next week. God bless you. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Twenty twenty was a landmark year. A lot of things changed. Welcome to Douglasville First United Methodist Church and our virtual services. Text the word live to the number on your screen and we will follow up. But missions here at Douglasville First didn't stop. We celebrated our third year of dinner church. Happy birthday dinner church. They sing and and uh, give the story of Jesus and full and I love all of you guys. We continued serving with our partners, the Boys and Girls Club, Burnett Elementary School. Burnett is very grateful for our consistent partnership with First United Methodist Church of Douglasville for your commitment to our school. Faith in Action. Fellowship of Christian Athletes, Good Samaritan Center, and Loving Hands. Hi, I'm Leanne Champion, the Director of Loving Hands Ministry in downtown Douglasville. We're so thankful for our partnership with Douglasville First United Methodist Church and our opportunities to serve the community alongside of them. We ministered to our seniors through Alpha Fowler Family Community and Benton House. We minister to first responders and healthcare workers, police and firefighters, and our friends at Kroger. Thank you for your continued dedication. for joining us this morning. To find out more about Douglasville First United Methodist Church, follow us on Facebook or at our website, douglasvillefumc.org. If you feel led to give, please don't feel pressured, but you are welcome to do so. You can give on our website, douglasvillefumc.org, or you can text the word GIVE to 770-285-1077 or you can always just drop a check by the church. Have a great Sunday, everybody.